In this section, we will focus on tertiary and quaternary protein structures. We will discuss some of the examples of proteins that have different functions within the body, including cell-cell communication, structural support, and cellular transport. The complete three-dimensional shape of the entire protein, or the sum of all the secondary structural motifs, is known as the tertiary structure of the protein and is a unique and defining feature for that protein. The tertiary structure of proteins is determined by a variety of chemical interactions. These include a combination of all the different intermolecular forces from hydrophobic interactions, ionic bonding, hydrogen bonding, and other dipole-dipole interactions. It also includes covalent disulfide linkages that form between two cysteine residues. In nature, some proteins are formed from several polypeptides, also known as subunits, and the interaction of these subunits forms the quaternary structure. Weak interactions between subunits help to stabilize the overall structure. The insulin peptide shown here has quaternary structure. Insulin starts out as a single polypeptide and loses some internal sequences during cellular processing that form two chains held together by disulfide linkages, as shown in the previous lecture. Three of these structures are then grouped, forming an inactive hexamer. The hexamer form of insulin is a way for the body to store insulin in a stable and inactive conformation, so that it's available for release and reactivation into the dimer form. Proteins can be divided into different classifications, the first one we will look at are the fibrous proteins. These are characterized by elongated protein structures. They often form protein aggregates and create filaments or bundles that form structural scaffolds. Within animals, the two most abundant fibrous protein families are the alpha keratin and collagen proteins. We'll take a deeper look at both of these structures. Alpha keratin is the key structural element making up hair, nails, horns, claws, hooves, and the outer layer of skin. Due to its tightly wound structure, it can function as one of the strongest biological materials and has various uses in mammals, from predatory claws to hair for warmth. Alpha keratin is synthesized through regular protein biosynthesis, utilizing transcription and translation. But as the cell matures and becomes full of alpha keratin, it dies, creating a strong non-vascular unit of keratinized tissue. Keratin proteins are long and fibrous. There are two distinct but homologous keratin families, which are named as type 1 keratin and type 2 keratins. There are 54 keratin genes within humans, 28 of which code for type 1, and 26 encode for type 2. Type 1 proteins are acidic, meaning that they contain more acidic amino acids, such as aspartic acid, while type 2 proteins are basic, meaning that they contain more basic amino acids, such as lysine. This difference is especially important in alpha keratins because the synthesis of the subunit dimer, called the coiled coil, and shown here, require that one protein coil must be type 1 while the other must be type 2. They form strong ionic interactions to create the coiled-coiled structure. Coiled-coiled dimers are then assembled into overlapping protofilaments or intermediate filaments in a very stable left-handed superhelical motif which further multimerizes, forming filaments consisting of multiple copies of keratin monomers. The major force that keeps these multiple coiled-coiled structures associated with one another are hydrophobic interactions between nonpolar residues along the keratin's helical segments. The fibrous protein collagen is the most abundant protein in mammals, making 25-35% to 35 of the whole body protein content. It is found predominantly in the extracellular space within various connective tissues within the body, such as tendons and ligaments. Collagen contains a unique quaternary structure of three protein strands, 
wound together to form a triple helix. Collagen type 1 has unusual amino acid composition and sequence. Glycine is found at about every third residue. And proline makes up about 17% of collagen. Collagen also contains uncommon derivative amino acids that are not directly inserted during translations. These amino acids are found at specific locations relative to the glycine and are modified post-translationally by different enzymes, both of which require vitamin C as a cofactor. The two most prominent are hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine. And depending on the type of collagen, varying numbers of hydroxylysines are also glycosylated meaning that you can add sugar residues onto these motifs as well. The enzymes proleal hydroxylase and lysyl hydroxylase are required for the hydroxylation of proline and lysine. While hydroxylation of position 3 is shown in this diagram, proleal residues may also be hydroxylated at the fourth position as well. Hydroxylase enzymes modify amino acid residues after they have been incorporated into the protein as a post-translational modification. These enzymes also require vitamin C as a cofactor. Further glycosylation of the hydroxylysine residues allow the incorporation of the disaccharide galactose glucose at the hydroxy oxygen. This slide provides an overview of collagen synthesis which takes place predominantly in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, shown in light green here. Taking a closer look, we can see that the collagen messenger RNA is translated on a ribosome that's associated with the endoplasmic reticulum and is released as procollagen into the ER lumen. Hydroxylation of proline and lysine residues occurs, followed by glycosylation. The collagen monomers are then assembled into that triple helix structure. The procollagen is then packaged into secretory vesicles, transported through the Golgi apparatus, where more post-translational modifications can occur, and then secreted outside of the cell into the extracellular matrix. Once in the ECM, procollagen is cleaved to form tropocollagen, and then it's assembled into a fibril. You can see that these are overlapping, strong filaments that are held together predominantly by covalent cross-linking and hydrogen bonding. Several types of naturally occurring covalent cross-links have been identified in different collagenous materials and include the examples that are shown here. The process is quite complicated and can take an extended period of time for collagen fibrils to completely mature. Thus far, we've been focusing primarily on fibrous protein structures. Globular proteins, or spheroproteins, are spherical, globe-like proteins and are one of the most common types of proteins. Globular proteins are somewhat water-soluble, forming colloids in water. Unlike the fibrous or membrane proteins, there are multiple fold classes of globular proteins since there are many different architectures that can fold into roughly spherical shapes. The term globin can refer more specifically to proteins including the globin fold. The globin fold is a common three-dimensional fold in proteins and defines the globin-like protein structure of this superfamily. An example of the globin fold is the oxygen-carrying protein myoglobin. Hemoglobin is another common protein that carries this globin fold. It has a total of four globin folds, shown in red and blue. We'll talk more about the hemoglobin protein in detail in a later lecture. Overall, globular proteins are involved in many cellular processes and can serve as enzymes, cellular messengers, transporters, regulatory proteins, and structural support proteins. Throughout the term, we will become more familiar with globular protein structure and activity in a multitude of biological processes. A third major type of proteins are the integral membrane proteins. Integral membrane proteins are permanently attached to the membrane. Such proteins can be separated from the biological membranes only using detergents, nonpolar solvents, or sometimes denaturing agents. 
They can be classified according to their relationship with the bilayer. Integral polytopic proteins are transmembrane proteins that span the membrane more than once. These proteins have one of two structural architectures. The helix bundle proteins, shown here, which are present in all types of biological membranes, or beta barrel proteins, which are only found in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria and the outer membrane of mitochondria and chloroplasts. Bitopic proteins are transmembrane proteins that span across the membrane only once. Transmembrane helices from these proteins have significantly different amino acid distributions to transmembrane helices from polytopic proteins. Integral monotopic proteins, shown in the lower diagram, are attached to only one side of the membrane and do not span the whole way across. Number one in the diagram shows the interactions by an amphipathic alpha helices parallel to the membrane plane. Number two in the lower diagram shows the interaction of a hydrophobic loop. Three in the lower diagram shows the interaction of the protein by a covalently bound membrane lipid. This is called lipidation. And number four shows electrostatic interactions or ionic interactions of the protein with the membrane lipids. Peripheral membrane proteins, which are not shown in this diagram, are temporarily attached to either the lipid bilayer or to integral membrane proteins by a combination of hydrophobic, electrostatic, and other non-covalent interactions. Peripheral proteins can dissociate following the treatment with a polar reagent, such as a solution with an elevated pH or high salt concentrations. And the fourth major class of protein structures are the intrinsically disordered proteins, or IDPs. An IDP is a protein that lacks a fixed or ordered three-dimensional structure. IDPs cover a spectrum of states from fully unstructured to partially structured and include random coils, pre-molten globules, and large multi-domain proteins connected by flexible linkers. They constitute one of the main types of proteins alongside the globular, fibrous, and membrane proteins. Many disordered proteins have binding affinity with their receptors that are regulated by post-translational modification. Thus, it's been proposed that the flexibility of disordered proteins facilitates the different conformational requirements for binding the modifying enzymes as well as their receptors. Intrinsic disorder is particularly enriched in proteins implicated in cell signaling, transcription, and chromatin remodeling functions. In this section, you have learned about differences and complexities between tertiary and quaternary protein structures and the major protein structural types. We spent a lot of time introducing two of the major fibrous proteins in the body, keratin and collagen as we will not really revisit this type of protein type through the rest of the term. We only briefly mention the globular proteins and IDPs, as most of the proteins that we will focus on during the rest of the term will fall into these two classifications. So we will see these a lot. We also introduce the different types of integral membrane proteins, which will play a bigger role during next term's lectures in Chemistry 451.